Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you all here today. Uh, this is our third kind of virtual meetup uh, for Minnesota First Robotics Competition, and uh, really appreciate all of you taking some time to kind of spend together. I hope all of you are um, safe and healthy um, and uh, doing well under some really trying and difficult circumstances, I know. But uh, it's great to see you all here. And as we've done in previous um, meetups, I think the first thing we would like to do is if you're able to turn your camera on, turn your camera on and then maybe in the chat, kind of tell us, introduce yourself to, to the group. So your name, team number, Nice, thank you all so much. It's good to see you. Um, so today uh, we are going to have uh, five teams present to us today and there is a theme. Uh, we really wanted to give uh, an opportunity to teams that unfortunately weren't able to compete at a regional event this year to kind of, uh, um, kind of tell us what they've been doing this season and show us anything they'd like about their team, their robot, outreach activities, all kinds of things. So I personally am really looking forward to kind of hearing and seeing what, uh, what these teams have done because we really haven't had a chance to really um, see any of them, unfortunately, in a kind of a competition environment. So um, we're really looking forward to that. We've got some more trivia questions for you and we're gonna give away some volunteer swag. Um, and then we're gonna hear at the end about uh, the face shield projects that are ha happening, uh, both with 2052 coordinating things in the Twin Cities, as well as some work that's happening up in Northwest Minnesota as well. So um, that's the way we're gonna get started. I would encourage you, uh, if you have questions for anybody to uh, just unmute your mic and speak up if you're comfortable doing so, or else ask the questions in the chat. We'll monitor the chat and, uh, and we can get those questions answered for you and discussion going that way as well. So um, let's kind of get started. We're gonna start with uh, Team 3018, Northern Storm from St. Peter. And uh, I think it's Jaden and Luke and Job, I think it is. Are you guys ready to go? Uh, yeah, we sh should be. Luke, you wanna screen share? Yeah. Okay. Um, that work? Yep. Okay. Oh, who's going to start? I, okay, so, yeah, we're team 3018, Nordic Storm. We were going to be in the 10,000 Lakes Regional. Um, obviously, that didn't happen, but we're going to tell you about our robot. <laughs> I can take this one. Okay, so we have a six-wheel drop center with the open front so that we can have intake. And we maxed out our height so that we can get over the control panel for the long shots because we'll be touching on that later, but we can shoot basically wherever we want to. So we thought it was really important just for speed to just be able to go right behind the control panel and arc up a shot. And we have high and low gear um, shifting. So, you know, fast for offense, and then we switch it into low for defense so that we can push people. And the... Yeah, R2 droid on board essentially for the turret because we can just, we're always rotating so that we can look at it. So once when we deem it necessary to pop a shot, we don't have to aim or anything, we just hit it. And then uh, it's mostly automated so that we don't have to really think about anything. So the balls go up our turret automatically, it's automatically going to aim for the, in, or for the, holes you know so we just basically all we have to do is drive and hit the fire button and then laser cut plastic for our edges 
on the top, you know, bottom, front, left, right, and on a welded aluminum frame. So that was our new team members actually welded the aluminum frame, which was pretty impressive for them. Next, I'd say. Yeah, so here's some pictures of the robot, as you mm -hmm. can see. This is pretty early, as you can see, the wires and everything's kind of torn up. Next, I'd say. All right, I can take intake. Um, so the intake of our robot has five different uh, stages with belts, and um, each of those belts are dr driven individually by... Uh, different 3D printed gearboxes, uh, which we got the design from team uh, 4905. Uh, then we have photo switch sensors, which allow us to tell when the ball's at each different stage on there. And essentially, once one ball's fired off from the top, it immediately brings all the balls up one more stage because it sees that the top one is empty and then so forth as it brings them up. Um, for the actual intake itself, we have a pixie cam that allows us to see uh, yellow ball, the robot will send, uh, center on it and it'll go forward towards it. And the intake has five different compliance wheels. And also, I think we have a video here of the intake in slow mo for you to see. So, essentially, once one ball is fired, they all immediately will shift up one. So, yeah, that's nice in slow motion. Uh, normally, it's a lot faster than that. And for the motors that we used, we just used some like Denso throttle motors that are just kit of parts. So we had a lot of them and they're kind of hard to use, but because of the nice 3D printed gearboxes, it worked really, really well. Next. Yeah, so here's just some, yeah, here's just some photos of uh, on the right side is the gearboxes with each of the churros going out of them. Uh, the frame as it's being welded, and then one of the side plates where all the uh, gearboxes mount onto. Mm -hmm. So, he, Jane was talking a little bit about the pixie cam for targeting the balls. Here you can kind of see a screenshot of that. Um, it'll, yeah, you hold down the trigger and it's going to automatically search out any of the balls and go towards the closest one and pick it up. Um, yeah, and the intake, like having those sensors at every stage is very useful because that way you know like exactly you have four balls and one of them is in stage five ready to shoot. And that allows us to like really quickly shoot and collect balls without having to worry about like where they are in the mechanism because it just automatically sends them through. Okay. Play the one on the left. This is before it's tuned in, so it's a bit. This was like right when we got it running, basically. We just wanted to see how fast they could get cycled through. And then here it was tuned a little bit more, but still not perfect. But it's gotten better since then. Mm hmm. These are just, we had better videos for those. Yeah, so with our turret shooter itself, um, it has a 360 degree rotation. Uh, it can go basically all the way around anyway, uh, as, as much as it really wanted to. We were aiming to do it twice, but we realized that wasn't really necessary for what we wanted to do. Um, then we have vision tracking. You can see on the front part of the robot, uh, there's a camera with a little... Uh, green ring around it uh, for the LEDs, which are twice as bright as the normal ones, I think. Um, then we have an angle controllable shooter head, which if you can play that video, Luke, um, we were able to not only change how fast the RPMs were going, but the angle of our shooter. So that depending on how close or how far back we were, um, it would change on its we own. We can change the arc, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the cable management was about 32 inches long and it was about three pounds and we had, or wait, not three pounds. We had a three pound, um, constant, constant. force spring to be able to pull that down and keep it, uh, nice and easily, uh, movable. We went through multiple designs for mechanisms to retract the cable because that's just kind of difficult to, because you pulling it up is easy, but pulling it back down at the right tension was really difficult. 
Uh, yeah, and then we use a Neo brushless motor, which we didn't need to max out its RPMs. We only used about 3,000. Um, if you want to go to the next one, Luke. Uh, here's a few pictures of the actual turret shooter itself in different pieces. The middle is the two pieces together. Uh, left side is that hood with the actual shooter on. I forgot to mention that there is a servo also that is with a cast aluminum uh, gear. And that's what actually changes the angle depending on what we want. And then that right side is the little funnel that brings up the ball. So a bit more on that vision system. So we have that ring light on the front and we have the camera, which goes into the Raspberry Pi. And I, I mean, I'm the, was the one that worked on this mostly. Um, we have a, we made a thing with grip. You can see it over here in the picture. And it'll turn down the contrast or turn down the uh, exposure a bunch, you know, so you only can see the green, the super bright reflective target. And we were able to get that working quite reliably. And then something kind of unique is that not only is the vision done on the pie, like you also have all the math that determines the arc of the ball and stuff. That's also done. So all the all the RoboRio really has to worry about, it just gets the target RPM and the target angle, and it does that automatically. So we kind of have like a whole autonomous robot on top of the robot. And when you want to shoot, you just pull the trigger and it will automatically get all the angles and stuff worked out for you. And yeah, we just, in order to determine that, we use the different heights of the target based, you know, in the picture, obviously if it's smaller, it's going to be farther away. And then we use the, um, we found a bunch of different points that worked, that got it into the target. And then we created this nice graph to kind of guess at the point, or not guess, but you know, figure out the points in between there. And that means we can get like a lot of our shots in. I mean, and we were tuning it more, but I would say probably at this point, 90% or like definitely 90% in the big target. And like most of them go in the little one as well. Um, here's kind of, how we have three different shot ranges because of that hood on there that does allow us to flatten out our trajectory a little bit, but obviously it's not able to get it perfectly straight. So our ideal shot right here is the apex shot in blue. And that's when we're fairly close to the robot or fairly close to the target, I mean. And that like right around the initiation line. And um, that means that the ball will go in perfectly horizontal because it's right at the apex of its trajectory. Then when you move a little bit further back, you're, still, you're on the near side of the control panel. And that's when it's still gonna go into the inner port, except it's gonna be more on a downward trajectory. And then if you go back behind the control panel, then you get into, well, I mean, we have the long shot and the far shot. So the far shot is then, it's only gonna go into the big target because if you try and get it in the little one, it would actually hit the top. And we figured it's better, you get more points, you get more points by getting it in the big one than if you fail to get it at all because you were aiming for the little one. Like it's a better bet that way. Um, climber. Okay, I can touch on this a bit. So this was our last project, so we don't have a whole lot of good pictures of it because this is right before we got shut down. So it's a two hook mechanism that just clamps onto the bar, you know, for stability with airline cable attaching it to a winch mechanism on the robot. And it just gets put up with drawer slides that we um, attach to the robot and to the hook. Those come down and then it just winches itself up. It's really simple. Next, I'd say. Yeah, that's, that's basically our robot. <laughs> we really, you know, we're bummed we weren't able to compete, but hopefully we'll be able to towards the end of the summer or something. Yeah, still great experience. Yeah. So, great job, guys. Great job. Thank you. Questions for Nordic Storm. Uh, Corey's got one. Corey, do you want to 
you want to ask your question? Yeah. So you said you had five stages in an intake. Uh, that you must use five motors. How many PDC slots did you use up, or how did you get around the limit on that? Um, Luke? Yeah, well, I mean, we did use five, five slots for that. And I mean, you know, there's a lot, they, they only need like the 30 amp slots because they're smaller motors. And so we were able to um, do that. And since they're usually not going to be running at the same time, like as you're driving around, because you're going to most likely suck up the ball and it's going to go immediately. Like it doesn't draw too much power. So we, we, I mean, it worked pretty well. <laughs> we never had issues with it really. Well, yeah. I was just thinking with the, the not, not necessarily a power budget, but with your drivetrain, your shooters, your winch mechanisms. Oh, just wait. Uh, not, not wait, just number of motors. You're limited to 16 slots. Uh, did you hit the limit? Did you fill all 16 slots? We did not. We still have, I think, I think we might have a total of 14 motors. I'm not positive on that, but something like that. Almost. Yeah. Um, I just see in the chat there, how'd you decide on programming language? So we use Java as our programming language. And are you self-taught? Yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of am. Because, I mean, I've been programming a lot. Luke, and, when did you start programming? Uh, I don't know, fourth grade or something? Well, I mean, I started, like, actual programming, like Python and stuff. Then I did, like, Scratch before that. But... Yeah. Here, I'm going to share the URL for our CAD file. I think this will work. Yeah, please do that in the chat. That would be great. Let's see if that works. Right. All right. Great. Nordic Storm, thank you very much. How many team members did you have this year, this season? Hmm. You know? 19 or something? What did you say, 19? I said 17. It's I thought it was like 18 to 19 around there. 18, um, yeah. Last year we ended up only having like eight or nine, and so we've grown a lot this year. We with had a lot of new members. Yeah. So. It was a huge increase. Good. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, All right. So let's uh, let's uh, before we get to our next team. Here's our first trivia question for the day. Okay. So I believe there are like 224 or 225. FRC teams this season in Minnesota, but this question is how many total FRC teams were there in the 2020 infinite recharge season? And again, one answer per one answer per individual, please. And just indicate it in the chat. So the person who's closest to the, to the actual number will, uh, will get a, get some volunteer goodies. So that's our, that's our first trivia question and we'll have the answer after our next presentation. So um, we're going to go next to uh, Tritons from Trinity School at River Ridge. That's team 4215. And uh, I'm not sure who's presenting. We have a lot of, I have a lot of names here. Annalise, Charles, Hunter, Katie. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, a lot of those names you named are uh, captains who couldn't make it. Katie is here, though. Uh, she is our business captain. Perfect. Uh, my name's Aaron. I'm the head coach. Um, a little bit of heads up uh, or just background about the team. Uh, we've averaged over our nine seasons, 20 students. And this year we had exactly 20 students. Um, the team had originally started when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, it was just myself, nine other students, because the minimum for a team at my school was 10 students. And then uh, one faculty member, David O'Hanley, uh, who unfortunately passed away uh, from pancreatic cancer two years ago. Um, it's It's been tough uh, bouncing back from his loss, uh, especially because this season, uh, the evening before kickoff, um, our primary build mentor, Dave True, also passed away uh, from a co uh, medical complication. Um, so when I when I when we talk about our season in a bit here, um, it's, it's really the students bringing their passion and love for robotics, um, as well as help from other teams. We had a lot of help from uh, the Robets, as well as Team 2220 and Egan. We've had really great neighbors who have 
had their mentors come by and, and help us out uh, getting things done, uh, guiding the students, and um, just, just a great example of gracious professionalism. Uh, so going into to what we have, we don't have a prepared uh, presentation, but uh, Katie, since she is our uh, business uh, captain, as well as will be the team captain next season, uh, she's going to talk about some of the non-robot things. And then since uh, we don't have the builder programming captain here, uh, I'll try and touch on some of the robot things. Uh, when Katie's done talking, I'll present and show some videos. So Katie, take it away. Thank you, Aaron. So in light of all the things that Aaron previously mentioned, we have made a lot of improvements in the past three years since I've been on this team. Um, one of, I think, the funniest improvements would be that we got a fire extinguisher. So a little story about that. Um, so in previous years, we always had an expired fire, fire extinguisher until this year when we implemented new safety measures. For example, having one that's not expired and that everyone knows how to use. Um, and also having new safety precautions. So new members if, for the build team when you first arrive on the team, instead of letting everyone use power tools, just like, you know, however they want, we implemented a way in which we certify you. So if you were a upcoming, if you were a new team member and you wanted to do build team, you would first uh, kind of get trained in using tools just so that you don't cut off your finger because we're not liable towards you. and um, medical bills are expensive. <laughs> um, uh, so our safety has gone way up. Not that we never had safety, but like really focusing on that. Our fundraising also has improved a lot. Uh, ever since I was built, this is my first year being build cap, uh, sorry, business captain and being first year on the business team. Um, in previous years, I've been on all three teams. And this is the one that I've been on programming, build, and uh, business. And so this year, I made sure that we had the right fundings because in previous years, we were very short. Like things are very tight, especially when we were traveling. So this year, um, a little backstory. So this year, we decided to, to do uh, the regional Mariucci, or we were going to, but obviously, we're at home. But um, when I was in ninth grade, we went to Duluth, and that was a lot of money because traveling is a lot of money. So I really, this year I really focused on making sure that we had the right fundings for this year and then, pre and then the years coming. Um, yeah, Aaron, have anything else to say? Yeah, so that's uh, just a little bit about improving safety as well as improving funds. Uh, I think outside of the 5,000 for registration, we usually only had a working budget of about $2,000. Um, and now we have um, a rainy day fund that is uh, more than $5,000 in addition to a, a higher working budget. Um, so Katie's been, has uh, been sending emails and brochures and updating our website to make sure we get the sponsors that, that make robotics possible at Trinity. Um, yeah, so Katie, did you have anything else? Otherwise I can talk about the robot. Um, oh yeah, so a little fun fact about our team. Most teams are from ninth through 12th grade, but our team, we have seventh graders and eighth graders on our team, which makes everything way more fun. Yeah. It's a little exciting sometimes, actually. Yeah, and as a note, our, our high school is actually uh, 6th through 12th grade. So that's how we're able to do that. All right, on to some videos. Can everyone see my screen? Looks good, Aaron. Looks good. Great. Uh, so the first video we're going to watch uh, is our uh, climbing mechanism. Uh, whoa. So it's, um, I just lost my window somehow. There we go. Um, 
So as you can see here, we have this telescoping uh, PVC pipe. Um, so that extends to get up to this height. Um, you can see other mechanisms on our robot. We kind of have all of our circuitry nice and nestled down below here. Our shooter, uh, we actually decided against a flywheel mechanism just because in prototyping, uh, this kind of pitching machine with a wheel on either side uh, was giving us a lot more velocity. And um, instead of an arc, it's kind of more like a laser. I'll show off some shooting videos later. Um, but the primary thing about this telescoping PVC arm is it allows us to really ram into the, um, the pole bar and you can see it, it kind of flexed there um, but didn't break and still uh, we managed to get the hook on there. Uh, from there we have these orange cords uh, that go you can follow them down and they go down to this winch um, that'll then bring us up. Uh, our intake as you can see we have uh, six wheels uh, the outer two on each side are mechanisms to help center the ball and that just goes up into our ball storage which uh, can move up with uh, just a series of belts uh, up to the shooter. And so you can see us climb here um, and our hook does slide. So this is an example of our climb where we end up on the outside. Uh, you can see our mentor, Mr. A, is holding it because uh, this video was taken at Mira and they don't have the, uh, the stops in. So he's simulating where that stop is. Uh, and then we lift up. So a successful climb that takes about 20 seconds. Um, I also have an example of geez, geez, why do I not have that? Okay, there we go. Uh, of one where um, we're more centered on the bar. So if we're in the middle here, uh, the hook will not slip, and we'll just be able to climb uh, straight up without issue. Again, this video is also about 20 seconds. That's how long it takes us. So we get about 10 seconds or so to to get aligned uh, in that end game. Uh, moving on to uh, shooting. So we can shoot from anywhere. Our best shots come from the init line. Um, here's an example of an autonomous uh, program. So one, two, three. And um, ideally what we would want to do, but we didn't have time to program the autonomous further, is we would actually want the robot to then, after shooting those three, turn and then drive backwards to catch up those, uh, to pick up those balls in the trench and then fire, uh, fire them from the closer side of the control panel. Uh, again, because of uh, COVID, we didn't get time to, to practice that or to get that in. Um, if we did an auton where we were centered, I was unfortunately a bit late on this video, we can get the inner goal, one, two, six points. Um, and then and then uh, in teleop we can also shoot from the net line. And you can see we, we have a lot of power because of these two uh, powered wheels in, in kind of what I call the, the batting cage <laughs> um, pitching machine style. Uh, and so when you look at these long shots uh, from the other side of the control panel, um, you can see that we're, on these shots, we're catching it on the lower part of the arc, but actually this is about 60% power. Uh, we had a number of shots at Mira. We had one that actually hit the backboard of this far basketball hoop here. Um, and we have also hit the roof of Mira before, uh, as well as the roof in the gymnasium of our school. Uh, so yeah, we kind of just had the philosophy of we'd rather have more shooting power than we need than, than not enough. Um, you can see here, this is where we would eventually mount our limelight to get some uh, vision tracking. And you can't see it in this video or image, but uh, down below these belts, uh, there are some IR sensors that help us index uh, how many balls we have in and, and kind of like 3018 automatically moving balls up. Um, in this video that wasn't implemented yet, but uh, after we had mounted the sensors, that was working really well. So yeah, our primary thing, just to kind of wrap up, was, was climbing. Um, I think throughout uh, Mira, as well as going to the Hmong Academy, uh, we managed to do 20 at least uh, successful climbs out of about 20 tries. 
Um, so climbing was our main thing. Autonomous was our next thing, uh, being able to shoot really quickly uh, and accurately into that um, into uh, that inner or even outer port, most likely for on the init line. And um, yeah, occasionally being able to shoot from farther away. So yes, uh, exactly right. What kind of motors we use, red lines with a gearbox. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the ratio is. Um, but yeah, it's red lines with a gearbox. Uh, where did we find our funding? Um, uh, grandparents of the students, uh, the Mashad family donated some. Uh, we also had action fencing, right, Katie? Yeah, so uh, for our funding, we try to keep with our previous sponsors. And then we both also expanded to, I think, Aaron's company this year, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, David True funding. Yep. Um, so the David the David True um, Memorial Fund gave us quite a bit of money. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Katie. Did you have? Oh no, you're else? fine. Don't worry. Okay. Um, <laughs> my company generously uh, matches time volunteered. Uh, so my paycheck, uh, the the amount that I would get paid, the number of hours up to twenty hours a year, which isn't a crazy lot, but some. Um, and then also, I made a personal donation to the team, which. Um, which uh, my, my company matched. Um, and actually this upcoming year, because of the COVID uh, crisis, they will be doubly matching. So when I donate again, uh, they'll double match as opposed to just equally. Um, I'd say the biggest thing we did differently, um, we actually had uh, the school's um, person who's in charge of, of getting funds for the school, getting grants and stuff. Uh, he came in and gave a presentation to the entire business team uh, kind of on some best practices for uh, cold calls slash cold emails, who to who to ask for, um, as well as the be the best way to kind of keep in touch and make a relationship with sponsors. Uh, so as far as um, Katie's tenacity of really emailing, I think we emailed them with shots what four or five times. I think I've emailed them at, at least five times, and then yeah, two and then both. they ended up donating two thousand dollars. So it's um, it's. <laughs> it's pretty great to have resources within the school to to kind of give us the best practices for for talking and interacting with sponsors um, and, and securing funds yeah. any other questions great any other questions for Aaron and Katie Aaron how many students on your team this year I don't remember but... exactly 20 20 yeah is that fairly typical for your team or is that the uh... The yeah. highest we've ever had was 34, the lowest was 10, and we've kind of averaged around 20. Sorry, Katie, were you gonna say something? I was, yeah, I was practically gonna say the same exact thing. Yeah. And, and remember, our, our graduating class sizes are um, usually 50 mm -hmm. on the high side, because we're- My class, is, my class is about 45, I think. Yeah, yeah, so, so this is a, about like 7% of the student body. Yeah, that's great. Or, or something like that. Yeah, that's great. Good. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. I know, Aaron, your team has been through a lot over the last couple of years with the loss of some really important mentors. And um, just, uh, again, our condolences to you and your team on, on that loss. And uh, I'm really impressed with your resilience and your ability to kind of work through that and, uh, and continue to be um, successful. and motivating and inspiring to your students. So thank you for doing that. I really do appreciate it. And I know we miss Dr. Hanley and we miss uh, Mr. True a lot. I think the entire community does. So thanks again for presenting. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see, so the trivia question for the first one, it was actually 3,906 teams this season and Jaden, from Nordic Storm was really close. 3,900 was his answer. So he'll be getting some, uh, some gifts from us. And uh, before we move on to our next team, here's the next question. So among those 3,906 teams, how many different countries were represented this year among FRC teams? All right, that's our next question. All right, team number three is going to be Blue Twilight from Egan, team 2220. And I think uh, Cassie, I think, I believe is going to present. Is that right? Sharing her screen. 
John's going to share his screen and Cassie is going to lead the discussion. Yep. Hello, um, I'm Cassie. I'm uh, part of the MTR team from Blue Twilight. So pretty much this is just like a little uh, overview of our season. We're going to be going over some outreach we've done uh, and some newer projects that we have. So next slide. Um, this is just a little bit of a summary of our team. We're celebrating our 13th season and we have thir we got 30 students this season, 57% male. And uh, our team consists of Egan High School. We actually come from a bunch of different students and a lot of homeschoolers too. Uh, we have nine mentors and 14 2020 alumni mentors who also help out. And our mentors come from 3M, Thomson Reuters, Target, University of Minnesota, and other different companies too. So uh, our mission is building robots, developing student leaders, and doing STEM outreach. And we are based out of Egan School with a booster club. So the next slide, please. So one of the bigger things we've been doing for outreach this year is we have set up our PACER workshop program. So earlier in 2019, around May, uh, we got in contact with the PACER Center. So if you don't know what the PACER Center is, it is a place or a program that works with kids with disabilities um, to set them up in their life and just try and uh, make their life more enjoyable and have fun. So what we did was we created a, we um, were able to take over a program that is the Tech for Girls workshop that happens every month. So every single month we would um, go to the PACER and we would present a workshop that we created. So here's just a couple of the workshops that we created. And we've been doing this since about October when we first got in contact in May. Uh, the next slide, please. So another big thing that we've been doing this year is that we've been able to start and mentor different FRC or first teams, I mean. So we were able to start the Biotic Bears, which was an FLL team that was that competed this year. Um, you can see in some of the pictures we were working with them and they were able to go to a regional. We also were able to start a um, junior FLL team. Um, and unfortunately, they were never able to compete because everything got canceled before their um, expo but we were able to get the, uh, these first graders inspired into robotics. We've also been in contact with different FRC teams. Yeah, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we, the, we host and run uh, four F, F first events annually. So um, these four events consist of an FLL practice tournament, an FLL qualifying tournament, an FTC qualifying tournament, and a week zero practice competition. So we pretty much um, organize these events and we help set them up and run them over the, every year. So we did those this year. Um, next slide. Uh, some general things about different outreaches here is we were able to present 26 seminars for different first teams and different people throughout the program. And we ran 22 camps this year. So underneath is just an examples of the different types of camps that we were able to run. Some other big events that we um, ran throughout the year was our Cookies, Colleges and Careers uh, uh, panel where we talked to different uh, women about uh, robotics. We were also at the 3M Robots in the Plaza. We worked with Girl Scouts throughout the year and we were also at the State Fair. Uh, lastly, for our outreach, another big thing that we were able to do is um, through our Robots Without Borders program, we were able to travel to Poland and Ukraine, and we partnered with the Spice Gears and um, the Neuroblink. And so in these countries, we were able to set up and run camps and um, run different seminars that people could attend and get more people interested into robotics through these. So you can just see a couple of our pictures. next slide. 
All right, so I'll be talking about the actual robot we had this year. So our robot, we were planning on going to the regionals at Heartland and Montreal. We didn't get to go to either of those, which was kind of sad because I know like me and a lot of other people on the team were very excited to go to those. So for our actual robot, we had intake that was for, that was rollers. Those rollers would take the ball in and bring them up into a hopper system, which would work as a sort of store. And then when we wanted to shoot the balls, they would go up the uh, shooter with flywheels. So they would go up, uh, gain speed, and then go out. Our shooter was not adjustable, so we were planning on going to one spot and shooting from there. And then we also were planning on having a climber that didn't end up actually going on, but uh, Max will talk about how we were planning on getting that. Yeah, so the climber was a spring-loaded climber powered by two constant pressure springs and a rope and winch system. So we could release uh, the rope, uh, allowing the arms to go up. We could hook onto the bar at any location and then winch the rope back down to pull the robot and arms upwards. And the whole process usually didn't take more than 10 or 15 seconds. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about the electronics on the robot. So basically we have always done uh, a UCB, which is the universal control box. We like to keep all the electronics nice and compact so the wires don't get stuck anywhere. Um, so it is designed by the electrical team. Um, and this year, rather than um, two levels, we have designed a new flat design and we have created it using CAD from start to finish. We manufactured it using 3D printing and CNC technology. Um, so we have received some great feedback and um, about the 3D printing and design and we're learning how to better use these technologies for next year as we couldn't quite implement this uh, implement them this year. Next slide, please. Okay, so I can talk a little bit about what we've been doing uh, regarding the current world situation. So we've been trying to help out as much as we can uh, with coronavirus. Uh, chiefly, we donated all of our N95 masks to the Minnesota Nurses Association. We've also been sewing our own cloth masks, as well as making 3D printed ear savers and face shields to protect the doctors and nurses who need them. We've given these uh, products to the Children's Hospital, the Regions Emergency Room, Deco the Dakota County and um, the state of Minnesota. We are also running a local food drive to help support families who cannot get this food for themselves. And then we've also started to produce STEM and safety videos in order to try and engage some of the younger crowd um, like kids stuck at home that don't have stuff to do, they could watch these videos and do at home projects. We'd also like to shout out team uh, 20, 2052 for uh, giving us some plastic, sh plastic sheets for the face shields and 2667 for helping us with the filament. Ah, that's about it. Perfect, thank you very much. Questions for Blue Twilight? Max, can you tell us a little bit more about those STEM and safety videos or how can people access them? Uh, so I believe we're planning on posting them uh, to our YouTube uh, channel. I'm not sure if any are up yet. If not, they will be shortly. Okay. And they cover, cover all sorts of topics. Some are about the camps we've done or our season and stuff like that. So, thank you. So I assume on social media, you'll be letting us know kind of when those are available. Of course, you can watch our Instagram for okay. more information. Sounds good. Other questions for Egan? Great job. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. All right. Um, before we move on to our fourth presentation, the last question, trivia question, there was 36 countries represented among our FRC teams. And uh, we're going to give that prize to Luke. I think also from 3018, he guessed 34. There was an answer for 35, but that was a second guess by that person. So we're gonna give this to Luke today. So um, congratulations. All right, 
uh, we got another question for you, and then we're going to move on to the data bit. So um, I think all of you know that uh, rookie teams have high numbers. And so the number of teams that are joining FRC continues to grow every year. So this is the question about what is the highest FRC team number this year? Not in Minnesota, but everywhere. So that's our question. All right, next is the data bits from Park High School and Cottage Grove. And uh, I've got here Sean, Alex, Gwen, Brandon. Are you ready? Yes. Go for it. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hello everyone, we are Team 3083, the Data Bits from Cottage Grove, and this is our 10th year of being a team. A little bit about our team, we were funded in 2011 by James Huber. We were 2012 Minnesota State Champions, and currently on our team we have over 40 students and 18 mentors. This is a list of our improvements and growth during our season, so we hosted demonstrations and presentations. We established more FLL and FLL junior teams in our community. We began machining CAD projects, so that's getting CAD involved with every step of the way during the build season. Um, about preemptive design, about strategy and fabrication, we're together to build a functional robot. And this year, we had great success with starting a new programming language. So now we're going to talking about our sub-teams improvement, starting fabrication and CAD. So on the fabrication and CAD side of things, our 2020 robot itself consisted of a six-wheel tank drive on a kit of parts chassis. It featured a turreted and putted shooter that allowed it to shoot from nearly anywhere on the field. We used an over-the-bumper full-width intake with a gravity-fed horizontal staging and a polycord conveyor vertical staging. The entire thing was really designed just to do a lot of cycles in the top power port and do it consistently well. Uh, where the fabrication sub team really took off though was the use of CAD uh, with our sponsor SolarWorks who gave us the licenses for some accounts. It has allowed us to make pieces of the intake and uh, like pieces of the intake made of polycarbonate same with the uh, frame of our sh shooter. It has also allowed us to make our own 3D printed objects, like the entire hood of the shooter, the drag chain wheel around the turret, and all of our mechanical wheels on the intake. Uh, along with that, strategy has been a large development to fabrication because of the preemptive robot design that has allowed the team to start building robots with a clear goal in mind and gets everyone on a, uh, the same page. And uh, of course, another great thing to have that will really further the sub team is a lot of new members who are both interested and dedicated to their work. So for a programming sub team, this was a year of a lot of firsts and new things. Uh, the biggest change was we switched to a new programming language. This year we used Java. In previous years, the last nine years of our team, we had used LabVIEW. At the end of last season, we had very few students who had any experience with text-based languages at all. And we had no mentors or students who had any experiences with the Java libraries. This had a significant educational challenge to us, but we overcame it. We actually ended up with a bot that had more advanced features than we had ever implemented before. This year, we made many changes about how we control our bot beyond just the language. One of these changes was our increased use of the Spark Max motor controllers. Last year, we used these but they were only used as basic speed controllers that happened to work on brushless motors. This year, we used a CAN interface that sped up debugging and configuration, and we also ran most of our PID loops on the speed controllers themselves, which sped up our main program and allowed for a little bit more precise control. Along with that slightly modified approach to PID, we also took some new approaches to how we use our controls. This year was the first year our team had implemented a velocity control PID loop, which allowed us to have more precise and consistent control of the exit speed of a power cell when we launched it by controlling the speed of a flywheel and allowed us to control our speed of our drivetrain for more accurate autonomous driving. 
This was also the first time we successfully imp implemented profiled PID controllers. The control of our set point over time allowed us to make the outputs of our control loops more accurate to the physical systems, which made our tuning simpler and more scalable to short and large values. Uh, this was also a year that marked a milestone with their vision software. We used our limelight last year to develop vision models, but we didn't implement them into our software because we never developed the uh, models until too late into the season. This year we created models within the first week and they were win our design for the entire time. And we used them to automate tasks for when the driver would have a blocked field of view. These approaches all came together to create some more advanced automation than we, than we had done before. This included three main things. One, autonomous driving. In the past, we'd used a basic positional loop controlling the output of the speed controller directly. This year, we had a profiled loop feeding into a velocity loop that controlled motor output, which allowed us to have a single routine that would take a speed as, a distance, as an input and automatically drive a distance from a few inches to the entire length of the field as quickly as we could. We also automated our intake. Using vision tracking, we would automatically steer towards the ball when the driver held a button. And we automated our staging belts with photo sensors that would detect where balls were and automatically run motors to bring them up to the launcher when needed. The feature we were most proud of was our automation of aiming because we hadn't done something before like that. We, when toggled on by the driver, the entire shooting system was automated. We used our vision tracking to aim our turret at the target. And the vertical angle was fed into a statistical model that created a launching speed and a hood angle for a movable hood. So anywhere within our range, we could automatically shoot into the upper target. Uh, these approaches all came together to create our autonomous routines. As a team last year, we didn't use an autonomous routine. And because of that and our recruitment numbers over time, we only had one student this year who had ever created an autonomous routine to use in competition. This created another educational challenge that we did overcome. And because of our different automated features and the modular nature of the command-based architecture, we were able to create a set of multiple autonomous routines. This year marked a uh, many, this year marked many new things for a programming sub team, and we hope to grow even more in the coming seasons. Now on to our outreach sub team. So last year, our team was able to start two FLL teams and one FLL junior team. And this year, we are able to continue those three teams along with, uh, we started three new FLL teams and one new FLL junior team. Um, throughout the year, the, their season, four of those teams we student mentored. Once a week, uh, members of our team would walk down to their school and help them with any projects or questions they had with any parts of their building programming or their poster boards. Um, the other three additional teams we assisted via email any questions they had during the season, and also we helped them register their teams in person before the season started. This was our first year doing a shop tour for our FLL teams, and the four Crestview teams, um, we got to introduce them to what high school robotics is like, and the similarities and differences between FLL and FRC to hopefully inspire them to continue first robotics throughout their years of schooling. We also did a lot of new uh, community demonstrations along with continued a lot of our past ones that we have been doing for several years. Uh, our biggest one has been our elementary robotics sessions. This was how we got to start FLL. It's how we got our name out there. So at schools would invite us to come and give a se robotic session at one of their family, not family fun nights, one of their um, end of the year it's fun days and students would sign up to come and see our session and we'd have an FLL presentation and interactive STEM activity and a portion where they could drive our robot. We also visited nurse, our nursing homes this year and uh, one uh, demonstration we've done every single year uh, as a team has been Oldman Middle School's Math and Science Night and at that event we just get to drive around our robot and let the kids drive it and um, just let them see how uh, what high school robotics is like and hopefully inspire them to join it the next year. Um, over the summer, we also do a lot of summer parades, all four in our community. Uh, we're joined by our sponsor, Marathon Petroleum, and three FRC teams, Team 2175, the Fighting Calculators, 3206, the Royal T-Rex, and 3130, the Ares. 
So uh, now, lastly, on to the strategy sub team, which is our most recent sub team. It was founded. Uh, it was this was its actual or first actual year. So um, you could really break it up into two main categories. We have it in is so firstly the design aspect, where strategy aids the fabrication sub team by analyzing the game at the kickoff and trying to find what robot we should build. Uh, this keeps the priorities of the robot goals and the fabrication sub team more in line and allows for much more efficient work. This uh, such process is something that we can keep uh, we can keep going for the years to come and will heavily aid us down the road just because it does organize the fabrication team and that's something that we do struggle with at times. So keeping it organized will help us significantly. Uh, along with the other part of strategy would be the scouting aspect. For the entire team's history, we still use uh, to paper scout, but that all changed when we received scouting tablets and signed an app in 2019. In 2020, the app only progressed more where the UI was more user friendly. We were able to add an entirely new section of scouting and the data was much more efficiently collected. Uh, along with the scouting app came the spreadsheets. Our data analysis worked superbly in 2019 for our first year of ever having such advanced data. But uh, of course, as all things do, it got better. And in 2020, we were able to buff the simplicity of the sheet, compress all of the separate tabs to organize the, the uh, chaos that it used to be. And most importantly, further our predictive measures using many different formulas and algorithms that we would use, uh, we were very closely able to predict what every team in the match will do, uh, how many points they have a max of scoring, how many they'll likely score, where teams will likely go, and then uh, as of new this year to form a semi-automatic pick list where we can choose what teams we want. It'll sort them by our, our own uh, weighted ranking metric and then it, it'll give us an idea of teams to pick but um it's something new obviously still being man manually because as all data is it's not always perfect but uh it's still things that we can and will likely use in the future years and can keep our scouting hopefully super sustainable And that is it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, team. Questions for DataBits? That scouting app looks really, uh, looks really incredible. I think you'll really be able to build on that. So great job. Um, there was a question about Java and maybe you could just for those who weren't on the chat or not paying attention to the chat, I guess. What was the reason for moving to Java for you as a team? Uh, yeah, that choice to switch languages was a mostly student-led decision. A few students were interested in trying out the text-based language. And so the mentors were encouraging in our effort to do that. We tried it out over the summer and we ended up making the switch for the actual season. Great, good. And I don't recall how many students are on your team this year. We have around over 40 students on our team. Nice. nice. Good size team. Good. All right. Any other questions for DataBits? Hopefully, we will get to see your robot in action in an off season event. Uh, congratulations on 10 years. So it's, it's Thank really you. great. Yeah. You're one, you're one of the one of our veterans now, so thank you. All right, so uh, let's see, where was I? With uh, highest FRC team number this year, that last question was, at least according to the Blue Alliance, it's 8428, which is the Outlaws from Naples, Florida. And our uh, trivia contest judge is going to send some stuff to Owen and to Greta for that one. All right, so we have one more trivia question and one more presentation. So before we get to Granite City Gearheads, here is the question. It's about actually our five teams that are presenting today, 3018, 4215, 2220, 3883, and 3244. And the question is, in total, if you count up all the number of times that these five teams have qualified for state, what's that number? 
All right. While you think about that, we are now going to go to our last presentation. This will be 3244 Granite City Beerheads from St. Cloud. And I'm going to turn this over to, um, to Corey. All right. Well, thanks for waiting in this long. Uh, all these presentations were really great. Me and Natalie, our team captain, will be presenting a little bit about our team. So I'll start out with a little overview of what our team is about, uh, how big we are, and then we'll talk about our season and why I'll run the slideshow and we'll collaborate together and talk about our robot. So just so you don't have to look at me the entire time because I'm boring, we'll just bring up our slideshow here. So we identify as a very small team, uh, mostly a community-based team until just recently. This year we had 10 students, five of them being rookies to the season. Uh, no, we had no seniors on the team. Uh, with, our, with our community team ethic, we, we do struggle with uh, recruitment. We have very little involvement or uh, acknowledgement from the school until just this year where they did hire a coach to be more that liaison between the team and us. So that's been a great improvement and has gained us some some new assets for the team. At best though, with those 10 students we have on the team, most time we find ourselves with seven, maybe three to seven students showing up on build nights. Being a community-based team and having most mentors that work outside of the school system, we didn't start our meetings until late in the evening, 5, 30, 6 o'clock when we got started most evenings. And we did go later into the evening where students tended to have to leave early paper off. So in the evenings when doing some subsystem tests, we'd be lucky if we had one or two students there to, to run those tests. But what they built during the day, we uh, made sure it got tested so the next day we could move on and uh, any of our sponsors could help us build new machinery. Uh, some of the outreach that we do do, like some of the other teams mentioned, is we're really active in the, the local, local events like parades and uh, festivals. Uh, we're kind of disappointed that this year that a lot of those festivals are going to be discontinued. Last year we had our first booth that we kind of were representing FIRST Robotics in central Minnesota. The booth at the Benton County Fair, we had nights where teams from FLL, FTC, and FRC came and demonstrated what they did on each night. We were looking to grow that this year. We found out that we may have even more space. So we're still hopeful for that to happen this uh, early August. So with that strong mentor-based team that we have, we have those 10 students. And at most, many times, we have seven to 10 mentors. So it's, there's lots of opportunities for that one-to-one -one, one -one working with students. Uh, our goal is really to inspire students that want to be a part of robotics and uh, help them build a really great robot. It, all of our students come from up to five different schools. So this year, we had students from Apollo Tech. We had some from Cathedral who dropped out pretty early in the season. A few homeschooled individuals, St. Claude Christian, and out as far away as Albany, who and Natalie who will be presenting with me later on today. So with that, uh, one other key point is Central Minnesota is a very VEC-centric uh, area. The school districts have uh, identified VEC. So we're trying to break that barrier a bit. And one of our mentors, or two of our mentors have started a FLL team at uh, St. Cloud Christian, which is really exciting. They're going into their second season this year, and we're excited to see what that does for exposure for the area. So, Natalie, are you uh, are you mic'd up here? Yep. Let's do this. All right. All let's right. Do this. So now for the fun stuff, robots. So this is a picture of our robot from this year at the state it was left when we found out our competition was suspended indefinitely. So a couple strategies we had right away was we wanted to be a low bot so we could go under the color wheel just to try to increase our, to decrease our cycle time and make things faster that way. We wanted to be able to shoot in the high goal because points wise we thought it was gonna be more beneficial and we knew climbing was gonna be really important for this game as, as far as points, as far as ranking points, that that was gonna be really important. So we tried to prioritize that. And then we really wanted to do the color wheel, especially as we got farther into the season and seeing other teams who kind of just set it off to the side. And well, if we can do it, we will. That, that was something we really wanted to do. Uh, when, our seat, when we ended up having to stop working, 
we did, hadn't gotten a chance to really get something done there. But hopefully if we get to an off season competition, that something we'll be able to get on there. So you want to go to the next picture? Yeah. So when we do our prototyping, we do a lot of prototyping in wood. And this year it worked out really well for us because over the off season, we had been prototyping shooters for Steamworks. So a lot of those translated really nicely into shooters for this game. So only a couple days in, we already had a functioning shooter prototype, which we'll show you a video of. I believe this was uh, Tuesday uh, after kickoff. So that initial shooter prototype, it worked fairly well, but we ended up continuing to prototype and try other things. And then this picture shows the prototype that we actually ended up building and implementing on our robot, which had a wheel to kick it off to the shooter, which ended up with a really nice shot. So with this wooden box, so we are eventually from this distance able to hit those uh, pipe clamps in the back at the eight and a half foot mark. So we're pretty happy with that. Uh, so I have some CAD stuff that I'm going to pull up here while she talks about our robot, from, from the, what we're going to do. Right. So a couple of unique features of our robot. So with wanting to be a low robot that, that could shoot in the high goal, we decided to make our shooter adjustable and the entire por back portion, of, well, the entire shooter portion of our robot actually pivots up and down, which it created some problems, but it also created a very unique shooter and gave us a lot of flexibility in where we could shoot. So we could shoot from the initiation line, we could shoot up against the wall, and our goal was also to be able to shoot from closer to the color wheel. We didn't get to try test everything. Uh, we ran it at week zero, but didn't get a lot of opportunities other than that to really test everything. But one of the things that's interesting is, so our intake, we had it on drawer slides, so it extends out and also back in, which initially we were thinking we were gonna intake over the bumper and then we ended up deciding to do a slotted bumper and, and intake it that way. And one of the problems we ended up finding at week zero is that there was some dead space in the robot and we ended up solving that with surgical tubing running in between the intake and the tunnel, which seemed to solve the problem pretty well. But one yeah, of the things is- Pictures oh. of that here that we can go back and bring up again. But one point I wanted to point out here is when early in the design process, we drew this, that was that wooden shop box that we designed. We knew that the potential is storing up the five balls in here. So one, two, three, four, five from the indexer with a gradually, gradual compression going on here. We knew that this box was going to be way too long for the robot. So that's what kind of drove us towards this, this tilting mechanism here. So we, our starting figure would be slightly raised, but we'd be able to lower it down to go underneath the color wheel and without an adjustable hood. That way we could shoot from multiple angles. Interesting little point to that. I'll go back to the slideshow. Uh, well, we can talk about one thing before you jump back. Oh, go ahead. There. Well, one thing that we realized might be an issue pretty early on is we were counting our ports in the PDP. And we were starting to look at, wait, are we going to have enough for what we're looking to do? So we ended up making a clutch for our shooter. That's coming up right here. You want to talk about the clutch? You probably could explain it better than I can. Sure. So when we were doing our, our PDP count, and that's why I asked the other team about how many motors they had, we realized that we were going to come real short. Actually, had we we're maxed out and we had no room for our limelight plug-in yet. So with that design of our shooter being across the top axle here and having an indexing wheel, we uh, dreamed up a, a clutch mechanism. And we have a CAD drawing of that. So 
here's here's that lower axle where the compliance wheels would be driving up to our flywheel shooter that is a dual falcon shooter at a 1.2 to 1 gear ratio so spinning it or overdriving the flywheel what would happen is and if i pull up the analysis is the flywheel would had a belt that came rode in this groove right here and as this flywheel would take off and this would spin this clutch mechanism would be clamped on here brake uh, with a cylinder we modeled it after the a combination of the dog shifting gearboxes and the vex pro sim three sim shooters that we we use a lot of we'd be clamped right here so these these wheels as the ball came in there would be locked into place so this axle could not spin while while the flywheel spun up and as soon as we shifted it with the shifter this this V groove or this uh, tapered clutch would lock in and start spinning the indexer, uh, drawing the balls up into it and pre uh, pre accelerate them before they hit the hit the flywheel shooter. So with that, with those wood models, we kind of skipped over that right there. Is we we prototyped a lot in wood, but this year uh, we uh, I, we bought a CNC router or one of our mentors bought a CNC router. So we were able to very accurately cut our prototypes and move on to into plastic or polycarbonate cutters. So the, here the students were cutting out some of, some of those ribs that you can see in the CAD drawing. So a lot of, that was a new uh, new process for us as CAD this year is all the poly and being able to do some polycarbonate cutting. Madeline, do you have more to add? Uh, all right, I'll throw, I, I guess we can throw some humor in there. One of the fun parts about having the CNC was we didn't take the sheets off of the polycarb until a couple days before we ended up having to stop. So at week zero, we were still running with the uh, covering on the polycarb. So we got lots of questions asking if we were going to keep that on there. But uh, it, it did a lot for the robot once it was taken off and it was very satisfying to finally see it. But So yeah. that I touched a little bit about our, our goals, our timeline of when we were going to get our subsystems completed by. So with competing week, well, what would have been week five, um, we were running on what was kind of like a 12 week build season. So our goal was to have a working shooter and a plan for a climb by week zero, which we did have going. And then week three, we were supposed to have a uh, scrimmage. And our goal was to fix any issues from week zero and have the climb ready, which it was the set. It would have been the Saturday after they announced that the competitions were suspended, that we would have had that week three event. So our climber, we had it pretty well planned and it would have been ready to go, but we never actually got the chance to test it before we stopped. So this picture right here was taken the night before the announcement in the morning that schools would be shut down because in the, the hooks were just going on here. So the climber mechanism was similar to a lot of the other teams where it's a telescoping uh, constant force springs. We built them custom versal blocks to clamp onto this one and three quarter square tubing and using versal blocks as well. These arms would pivot around the shooter straight up and down. There were uh, some uh, spear gun cables that went down to a winch mechanism underneath there that would unwind the cable, extending the hooks, and then continue in the same direction to rewind the cable back up again, ratcheting using the half inch ratchet. Or, gear wrench to prevent any back drive. And there was the, that was just after week zero that we were starting to design that. Natalie, do I have another slide? Um, or do you have more to talk about? I don't think so. I think. So this year, there's a two new item. I, I don't know if Natalie had this in her notes here. But okay. We designed some. 3D printed brackets inspired by other teams to uh, hold our motor controllers. Our, we build all of our stuff off of our ability band, which sometimes gets really difficult to get everything fit in there. So this 
bracket right here, I would hold four sparks or four talent SRXs or Vicar SBs. And then this bracket right here would actually hold our loosely fit four pneumatic valves. Beyond that, is there any questions? Questions for Corey and Natalie? It's a question in the chat, Corey, about uh, jamming, I guess, with the power cells. Any issues there? Uh, yeah, Nelly, you want to take it or should yeah, I? Yeah, uh, we had a little bit of struggling with that and we definitely had to go through some testing and trying different things to solve it. Uh, our tunnel, uh, we had the cords in there slipping sometimes and they weren't always staying in the same spot. So that made some, that created some problems and challenges there. But, and yep. with our intake, with that dead space in there that we seem to have fixed, they weren't always getting where they needed to go. So we would have to bring the intake in to get them so our tunnel could actually uh, touch them and bring them in like it was supposed to. So I think this, this picture shows up fairly well. Or I'm not sharing it, am I? Mm -mm. Uh, let me share that screen. There we go. This picture shows up fairly Our two uh, tunnels on these side were independently driven. So Natalie was actually our co-driver on here and we programmed this as a drive frame. So she could jog it up and down, forward and backwards and give it a little bit of left and right to, to spin the ball through there. We never really fully filled this up there because after week zero, we just, that's when we discovered this dead zone and installed these poly cords that would stretch out. Some jamming across the back, which we had some plans for. We had ended up getting rid of the rib or covering the ribs with another layer of polycarbonate would be a flat bottom so they wouldn't quite bite in there well. But our robot spent a lot of time disassembled to get things put back together. And so after the week three was gonna be the really hardcore testing moment in there. But like I said, we were kind of in that 12 week build. Good, thank there you. A, there was a question about the clutch there too. Yeah. Um, they asked well, if the clutch worked well enough that we would do it again. Uh, I believe so. We, are, I, we went through several iterations on that. Uh, one of them, it was mainly the, the friction material. We had just flat to flat and that slipped a little bit much, but we kind of wanted that slip at the same time. Just so if uh, things got jammed up, if we were coming straight off the flywheel, that something would give versus stalling out the flywheel completely. I think it's something we'd look into. It's, it's the same idea as we built two scissors in first robotics. Uh, and the first one we were flamed upon. And when we built the second one, we took what we learned and uh, we were successful with it. So I would investigate the clutch again, the PTO. Good. Any other questions? All right, if not, Natalie, Corey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great looking robot, really great, thank you. Um, before we wrap up, let's, uh, let's go over the uh, trivia question. So it was actually, if you count up all the times that those five teams qualified for state, it's 15. And uh, Dave Hendrickson was, got that answer right. So Dave's gonna get some, some fun stuff. Um, Okay, so we're going to uh, go to a couple other people just to get some additional updates on um, projects that teams are doing to make face shields and other kinds of personal protective equipment uh, for healthcare workers and uh, first responders. So um, I'm hoping Scott from 2052 is online. Scott, are you here? I am here. Uh, Maria's got uh, also on here and she's got something prepared. Perfect. Thank you. One second here. All right. So real quick, we're just going to go over um, the face shield printing that we're doing. There we go. 
Um, so right now, for the past three weeks, we've been using 24 printers from schools in our district, um, running 10 hours a day, six days a week. Um, we're producing over 1,000 shields a week, and our target is about 200 a day. Um, so if you go to our website, team2052.com, we have a Google form there, and healthcare workers are filling out that form and placing orders on getting shields from us. Um, so far, we have delivered about 3,700 um, shields to people, and we already have um, 5,300 ready for people to come pick up. And we have over 10,000 ordered, and our goal is to send out at least 11,000. Um, let's see here. So, who we're sending to. Um, we've been sending to a lot of hospitals in the Twin Cities, um, clinics, fire departments, nursing homes. Um, we've also sent out of state a little bit. And um, just last couple, in the last couple of weeks, we started working with other first teams in Minnesota. So we've been either giving them shield plastic so that they can cover the shields that they've been printing, or we've been cutting the shield plastic for them if they have the plastic, but no way to cut it. Or we also took print advisors that other teams made but didn't have anywhere to give them to, and we started giving them out to our own orders. So the next steps in this project for us, um, we received enough plastic yesterday to cover 7,000 shields, and most of them will be used to fill all the orders in our backlog. Um, we still have about 4,000 to fill in our backlog and it should take a few days for us to make all of those parts. Um, so um, Scott will talk about this a little more in a minute, but basically um, we have found um, through working with St. Thomas Academy, um, we have injection molded face shields that are being donated and we find them to be a lot cheaper, they're faster, they're more durable, and they're a lot lighter. So when we have to ship them out of state, it's a lot easier. Um, so we will be trying to transition into doing those fully instead of um, printing our own soon. And we will become more of like a shipping management center and we'll be working on just the shield plastic. So I'll hand it over to Scott now. Thank you, Maria. So we've decided today we ran out of filament. So today was our, we put our last spool of filament on our, one of our printers today, and that's the last roll of filament we're going to buy to print the visors. The, the cost estimate that we got for uh, injection molded visors is about 28 cents a piece. Um, we're able to print 33, 32, 33 visors on a single one kilogram roll of filament, which now costs uh, 17, 18, 19 dollars a roll. The price has gone up. And so the price of buying an injection molded visor is half of what it costs to print it. And the injection molders can do more quantity in one day than we can make in a week with 24 printers running 60 hours a week. So um, as Maria said, we're starting to shift our operation. Um, we've had lots of community groups come through and see what we're doing see how we're doing it. Um, they've started talking to us about just having us start taking all of their orders and not try to do fulfillment of their own. Uh, maybe they'll send us visors. The, the rolls that we got, we had 7,000. We got three big rolls of plastic to so make 7,000 visors. That came from a community organization that was able to get the plastic donated, but had no way to cut it. They didn't have any machinery or anything that could cut it. So we offered to cut it for them and give it all back to them. They've decided that they're going to have us take as much as we possibly need, and they'll just take a little, whatever they need to finish out their orders. And I had a call with them for an hour last night. We were talking about how can we leverage all of the process and ordering and everything that we've got in place to start um, to sort of be the fulfillment part of what they're doing. So things are a little bit up in the air. Um, these 5,000 visors that were distributed yesterday still won't uh, empty our backlog. We have more um, people waiting for visors than we can give them, even with this ginormous order we received yesterday. 
So it's still a little bit up in the air. Um, the thing that we seem to be really good at is taking the orders and getting them out and then uh, getting the shield plastic and getting it manufactured into visors. Um, and that's probably where we're going to focus. We might start meeting, instead of meeting six days a week, we may only meet every other day or maybe two days a week and try to focus our efforts on distribution rather than on printing. Things are still a little bit up in the air, so we don't have any solid plans for anyone. If you are printing visors and you're planning to bring them to us, that's great. Bring them to us. We can definitely use them. We have more shield plastic than we have visors right now. But if you're planning to buy if you're planning to buy a new 3D printer filament to print more visors, um, I'm not going to tell you not to do that, but I will tell you that economically it makes more sense now to start buying injection molded visors. We have um, the, the person who's been donating our visors said that they will give us more for free. We don't know how long that's going to last. We might have to start paying for them. But um, spending money on 3D printer filament for visors it seems like there's better ways to spend that money now. Thank you, Scott and Maria. Um, again, you've got the um, the Slack, uh, the COVID nineteen Slack workspace for people to connect with uh, twenty fifty two and other teams that are working on this. But um, sounds like you're in a bit of a transition, so uh, we we should probably just make sure that teams are in communication with you about uh, what's what's most effective and impactful. I think um, so that things can be coordinated. So. And thank you very much. Do you have questions? Anybody have questions for Scott or Maria from Nightcrawler? This is just a huge task, and uh, really, uh, everybody, we're just so thankful that you're doing this, and really appreciate it. It's uh, it's, it's amazing what you've done already, and uh, being able to shift on the fly like this to find something that's even more effective and impactful, I think, has been great. So really, thank you for thank you for doing this and uh, keeping us updated on what's going on. Um, I think Jeremy Culleton is here from uh, up in War Road. So I think there's some efforts also going up in Northwest Minnesota. So um, Jeremy, are you, are you here? Yeah, I am. Um, we, uh, we've been pretty busy. I got Russ on here as well, but I, I'm gonna just uh, take your screen. And I'm just gonna show a quick little thing that they put together here. Of course. Um, but uh, basically, um, our group has started printing about three weeks ago uh, between us and the uh, 5172, the Gators. Uh, and we have uh, six printers running currently, um, two in Greenbush, uh, one in Badger with the 3750 Gators. Uh, and then uh, we have three uh, that are running in World. Uh, we actually have them running in, in World. We have them running in a student's uh, basement. Uh, so she's been kind of monitoring that stuff. Um, we put out, I think, probably close to a thousand face shields, if I'm not mistaken, and then we've been doing the ear savers um, as well. Uh, so we started with those. We've also, if you watch the screen, we've we, we also transitioned to uh, injection molding a little bit. We got about 240 parts uh, from a person uh, through Marvin, uh, where they took the mold and they made it. So they made a three-piece mold, and we're able to do that, um, and we put those together. And I would absolutely agree that that's kind of been uh, what I noticed too. You can build them faster and cheaper and um, it can happen really fast. So we were actually exploring um, buying an injection molder at one time for the classroom in War and uh, Marvin, who's our main sponsor, was actually looking at it as a, as a tool that we could be using. But um, so that's kind of where we're at there. Uh, Russ, anything to add? Like Russ has been kind of outreaching on the other side of our county. Uh, we're trying to fill that void as much as possible. Um. So I guess um, we're uh, we're doing a different type of shield. Um, I don't know where it could even come out of Jeremy, but uh, it's just uh, it just kind of fits tight around your head. No uh, rubber band needed. Um, Jeremy, did you want to talk about that box at all? Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, we we've been working with Marvin obviously quite a bit who's our our main sponsor in war road and um and and we kind of came up with uh there was a box we started talking about an incubation box and uh i connected marvin with uh ken rosen and i think ken's on and he can probably add to this after but uh right now uh just talking to marvin the other day they were sending a box down to the u of m 
and Ken and his people to approve. Uh, they would cut the parts, Claris will form them, and then uh, 5172 and 2883 will be putting them together, and those will get put out around the state from what I understand. I, I don't know, Ken, if you're on, you can add to that. Yes, so uh, Chris Hogan, a mechanical engineering professor at DU, is uh, working on the final design uh, on that uh, box uh, with Marvin and Polaris, and uh, we're still testing out prototypes. So it might be a week or two before we have that finalized. So yeah, so that's kind of where we're at, I think, in, in northern Minnesota. Like, we're starting to see the same thing. Uh, injection molding, obviously, is the way to go. But we've been filling other needs. We, I think our, our needs in Roseau County are getting pretty close uh, to enough. And so uh, Russ has reached out uh, to other places a little bit around us. Uh, to try to fill those voids and we can keep printing. Uh, we've been pretty fortunate uh, with uh, some donations from um, First Technologies and uh, Stratus and, and, and different places like that that have donated filament for us to use at this time. Um, and then also with Marvin. So uh, we've been fortunate that way. I, I, like I said, uh, for us, uh, the, the need is getting close uh, to being filled. Um, but still, there's always little pockets like we had uh, postal workers or EMT drivers or different things like that. I know Russ has been pretty busy on his end dropping things off all over. Yeah, we've had the Roseau County Sheriff Department, um, State Patrol, Kitson County Sheriff's Department. And now, like Jeremy said, uh, you know, the county's kind of getting filled up. Um, we had a a meeting with Life Care Medical and their their needs are pretty much uh, filled up but all true is kind of our feeder hospital where these communities get transferred to and so I reached out to them and uh, it sounds like they're more interested in ear savers and we're just getting the final clearance from them and then yeah we have a bunch to ship out so that's all I really have. Good. Jeremy, anything else? Nope, that's it. I know that it, it's been awesome working with uh, 5172. You know, lots of times we're, we're competing against each other so hard all the time that, uh, so it's kind of been nice to, to be able to, to work with Russ and Mary on a different aspect that, other than robots and, and to reach out that way. So it's, uh, it's been great that way as well. Good, thank you. Amazing job all of you are doing. Uh, there was a question from, uh, on the chat just about program sponsors. And again, I think, you know, Jeremy, you and uh, Russ mentioned the important role that Marvin Windows is playing in the work that you're doing. They're, they're a major sponsor for your team. I know they've been very supportive of FIRST Robotics uh, in the past. And for those of you who aren't familiar, 2052 got a lot of material initially from 3M. 3M was again, another huge sponsor for FIRST Robotics and they really were instrumental in uh, providing material that was really important for that fish shield project to get off the ground. So this has been a, a collaboration between everybody in the in our community. It's been teams and uh, sponsors and and everyone. So um, it's a really powerful example, I think, of of what we all can do together. I also want to, you know, again, as Ken mentioned, the University of Minnesota is involved in this as well. So. Um, you know, it's just really inspiring to see what's going on and uh, and how everybody is coming together to help with this. So, again, thank you all very much for 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 doing this and and kind of you know really not only helping our our first responders and our healthcare workers, but also I think just kind of giving us all some hope that uh, we're going to all kind of get through this together and we're all going to be uh, better at the other end. And and I think uh, we really um, really led the way for all of us. So I really wanna uh, thank you all for doing that again. Um, I wanna thank the five teams for presenting today. They um, really, it was a great job. I, you know, I just wish that we had an opportunity to see all those robots in action on a, on a competition field. And um, we're hopeful that, you know, maybe at some point with an off season event or something that we'll be able to, to do that and to kind of be together again. Um, before we close up, I just wanna make a couple of announcements. Just remember that on, Wednesday, April 29th, FIRST will be holding an award, a regional award show. I think it's at 7 p.m. on the FIRST Inspires Twitch channel. And uh, that's where the um, Dean's List, Woody Flowers, and Chairman's Award winners will be announced for 
um, 10,000 lakes, North Star, Seven Rivers, Iowa regionals, and a number of other regionals. There are actually three award shows. I think they start at six, seven, and eight, but I think the Midwest ones will be um, announced at seven o'clock. So please uh, tune in for that. And then next Saturday, there will be a first virtual showcase on May 2nd. That's at 10 a.m., I believe, Central Time on Twitch. So um, again, that will be um, kind of a wrap up of the season, if you will, um, and uh, should, be, should be a fun event as well. And then finally, I want to um, just share with you again, information about our own Minnesota First uh, graduation celebration. So this was announced this week. This will be Saturday, May 16th, um, starting at 1 p.m. Again, we're gonna use the Zoom platform to do this. And um, I just wanted to let you know that we have um, two guest speakers that'll be um, at the event. So the first will be an alumni, a graduate of our program. This is uh, Taylor Meyer. She's from team 2526 Crimson Robotics, just graduated from Iowa State University. She's now out in California as an engineer to apply medical resources. And she is also involved with uh, developing and making personal protective equipment right now during, during this pandemic. And then our keynote speaker is actually gonna be Amy Doherty. And um, Amy is the assistant director of the Minnesota State High School League. Uh, she is probably the number one fan of FIRST Robotics in Minnesota. And if you know, Amy is in charge of the robotics, state robotics tournament. And May 16th was actually the date that we were supposed to be uh, at the University of Minnesota campus competing for the state robotics championship. So um, we thought it was only appropriate to ask Amy to kind of say a few words at, uh, at this event. So um, again, please, if you're a mentor, just let your students know about this, your seniors, if they're interested in participating, um, they can go to the, um, this bit.ly slash and then FRC graduation um, to basically get some more information and to uh, sign up. So. Um, so that's the other uh, announcement that we have today. Any other comments or questions or things to discuss at this point? Aaron had a question about whether there be an email saying who the winners are if folks can't make the 29th virtual award show. We'll have to find out about that, Aaron. I'm not sure. Um, certainly we'll, I think we can at least make the announcement by social media with uh, Minnesota First Regional. So. Um, we can do that, but uh, we'll, ch we'll check up on that and see what's gonna be done uh, with that uh, if you can't make it. All right, anything else? Again, thank you very much for, for tuning in and, and participating and, uh, and being together for, for everybody and for all the teams and everyone in our community. We really appreciate this opportunity to kind of do this uh, on a regular basis and stay connected and support each other um, while we're, uh, while we're fighting this pandemic and really trying to get, uh, get back to some sense of normalcy, I think, uh, hopefully sometime soon. So um, again, have a great day. Um, please stay safe, everybody. And uh, hopefully we will see you at some of these other upcoming uh, virtual events and um, hopefully out in the community as well. So take care.